Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer, not I, but you, Lord Christ, through me. Even now as I preach your word, it's not my message, it's your revelation. I merely deliver it. And even now, <clears throat> as I exercise the office of teacher in your congregation, it's not my own eloquence or my own strength with which I labor, but it's the power of your spirit, of your resurrection within me. And even now, Lord, the prayer of this congregation is that we would listen, not with our merely human intelligence, and certainly our prayer is not that we would change ourselves with our own unaided self-will. But we ask that Christ, your Holy Spirit, would open our ears. And we ask that Jesus, your spirit of resurrection power, would enable us to be changed. Not even to be changed tomorrow or the next day, but here on the spot as we hear your holy word. In the power of your spirit, we ask. Amen. You can open with me to Isaiah chapter 40. When Isaiah was called to ministry, the living God said to him something that was fairly discouraging. When Isaiah said these words, Here I am, Lord, send me. God said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their eyes heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and lest they hear with their ears. When Isaiah was called into ministry, God met with him and gave him a great vision. And when Isaiah was called into ministry, God met with him and gave him not just a great but a, a, a perfect, life-changing message to preach. So there was a lot of good news in Isaiah's call to ministry. But at the same time, when Isaiah was called to ministry, God, who gave him a great vision, and God, who gave him a perfect message, said, Isaiah, you're going to have a bad audience. They're going to be dull their eyes are going to be blind and their ears are going to be deaf. Isaiah preached a perfect message out of a vision of God's glory. And yet the persons to whom he preached oftentimes in the moment weren't changed by his preaching. God predicted this and throughout the book of Isaiah... We have a perfect, awesome message, and we have the people who hear that message objecting to it for, frankly, stupid reasons. And Isaiah 40 is perhaps the high point of this perfect message, and the objections are perhaps the low point of human stupidity. The audience to whom Isaiah preached had two basic objections. One, uh, God's not powerful enough to take care of us. They were like, Babylon, I see how powerful they are. The Chaldeans, I see how powerful they are. God isn't powerful enough to deliver us. And the second objection was, I don't think God really cares enough to deliver us. In other words, maybe you have felt this way. One bad thing happens to you, but then two or three or four bad things happen to you and you begin to wonder, does God really care about me? These two objections, does God have the strength and does God have the will? Does God have the power and does God have the compassion and the concern to care for us? Put in the simplest terms, can God take care of me? And does God even care about me? These are the human objections to Isaiah's sermon. And God answers these objections in a series of powerful poetic images in Isaiah 40, showing what kind of power he has 
and showing what kind of care that he has. So he begins Isaiah 40 by saying, I'm going to bring you comfort. I'm going to bring you comfort. I'm going to end the war that's against you, and I'm going to forgive you of your sins. And the Really, one of the only commands in this whole chapter is the last three words in verse 9. Behold your God. He says, get up on a high mountain, herald of good news, lift up your voice, lift up your voice and fear not. Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense is before him. And so our outline this morning to conclude the whole chapter is that we could see verses 1 through 11 are God's message of comfort, God's promise that his power will take care of you. But after verses 1 through 11, we have two objections from people who are dull, who have eyes but don't see, who have ears but don't hear. And the first objection is, does God really have the power to save us? And we see that in verses 12 to 26. Isaiah obliterates that objection. And then third, does God really have the will to save us? Does God really care about us? And Isaiah tackles that objection in verses 27 through 31. You know, the, the Christian church always has, or almost always has trouble receiving Christian preaching because we hear our own objections we feel our own objections, and we push back against it. Astute Christian writers, uh, David Wells is one of my favorite. Carl Truman is one of my favorites. R.C. Sproul, who's in heaven now. Albert Moeller, whose uh, radio program I listen to almost every day. For a couple of decades now, authors like this have been writing about or speaking about the objections of postmodern, post-Christian culture. And the way, they, they, the way they could summarize our culture would be with uh, one word, fragility. Everybody is so fragile. How quickly do we cancel each other? How quickly and over what do we cancel each other? We're so fragile. And these wise Christian writers have talked about uh, you're always going to end up with fragility when you put self at the center. You'll always end up with fragility when you put self at the center. Because if I have a bloated sense of self, then anything you say or do that makes me feel uncomfortable, that makes me feel unsafe, that makes me feel bad about me, makes the whole thing fall apart instantly. This is because when self is at the center, self fumbles around with its own feelings and is just unable to handle things. If self is at the center, then everything is fragile and unreliable. In the wise words of David Wells, he says, the spirituality of the self is deeply subjective, highly individualistic, completely relativistic, and insistently therapeutic. I'll say that again real quick. David Wells says, the spirituality of the self is deeply subjective, highly individualistic, completely relativistic, and insistently therapeutic. No wonder Isaiah's audience would be resistant to a message that is the opposite of subjective, that is the opposite of individualistic, that isn't relativistic, and that instead of a human feelings-based therapeutic answer, gives a divine theological answer that meets the deepest needs of the human soul. Because you see, from a Christian point of view, when God is at the center is the only time that we can be delivered from the fragility of having self at the center. With God at the center, then all of a sudden, there's a right and a wrong, and there's a north star that is utterly and completely independent of my shifting moods and my easily fading feelings. There's an anchor that'll hold me. There's a hope that won't disappoint. There's a way to get through that isn't dependent on my momentary moods. So as we look at Isaiah 40, here's the question, church. Here's the question for you. Are you going to live with the fragility of self at the center 
or are you going to live with the stability of God at the center? That's the question of Isaiah 40. What will be at the center, the fragility of self or the stability of God? We'll pick it up in verse 18 of Isaiah 40. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it with silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot, and he seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. You see, you see the irony there? The, he needs a skillful human craftsman because the wood that he's worshiping is going to totter if he doesn't get a really good human engineer to fix it. Then he asks these questions. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. It is he, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted. Scarcely are they sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. There in verse 25, Isaiah's favorite title for God is the Holy One of Israel. When Isaiah magnifies God's incomparability, it isn't just his sheer power. It's his unassailable moral integrity, the Holy One of Israel. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the the greatness of his might and because of his strong power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths faint and are weary, and young men fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When Isaiah is going to speak of the difference between having self at the center and having God at the center, what does he say in verse 22? All the people of the earth are like grasshoppers. When God's going to speak of the fragility of having human kingdoms at the center or the stability of having God at the center, what does he say in verse 23? All the princes of the earth are as nothing. That would include all the Ron Johnsons and all the Mandela Barneses. All the princes of the earth are as nothing. And he makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. This chapter revolves around the core question of verse 18. You see that question in verse 18? It's repeated in verse 25. To whom will you liken God? To whom will you compare me? The answer is nothing. This is why theologians, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, John Calvin, they all kind of say the same thing, which is that it's a little bit easier to say what God is not than to say what God is. God is love. God is life. It says in 1 John that God is love. It says in John chapter 1 that in Jesus is life because he is our life. So the Bible doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say there is such a thing as love and God is the best expression of love. The Bible does not say that there is such a thing as life and God is the fullest expression of life. It's so hard to say what God is because it's not that there's such a thing as love or such a thing as life and God's the best example of it. God's not the example of anything. 
There is nothing external to God that he is not the creator and author of. God is love. God is life. And so there is no such thing as love without God being God. There is no such thing as life without God being God. And he is in his own perfect Trinitarian inner existence, the most bright and beautiful expression of life and love and everything that's good and true and beautiful that ever will be. And it's so difficult for us because we tend to measure, uh, we tend to think that human love is the measure of divine love, but it's the other way around. Anything that we see on the earth is the faintest, dimmest echo of the reality, the, the unassailable and even inapproachable reality of who God is. To what will we compare God? Nothing. But there's actually another answer from a guy who's become a good friend of mine. His name is Jonathan Edwards. He's been dead a long time. But Jonathan Edwards, he has, the, he has these, I don't even think he meant for them to be published, but I have them. They're called his miscellanies. It's like a, it's like a little notebook, not like, it literally is a little notebook of paper that when he was on horseback, he would jot down some of his thoughts about God. Uh, perhaps a better use of your time than Instagram, but I digress. But uh, Jonathan Edwards was meditating about this question, to what can I compare Jesus? And the answer Isaiah seems to give is nothing. The answer Jonathan Edwards gave was everything, everything. Because Colossians 1 says, not only did Jesus create all things, but in Jesus all things cohere and hold together. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, that all things are summed up in Christ. And so then Jonathan Edwards has page after page where he says the lion shows us who Jesus is. The lamb shows us who Jesus is. The most powerful uh, King in the world shows us who Jesus is. And the most humble, mistreated servant in the world shows us who Jesus is. There, it is kind of true that we get a glimpse or a glimmer of Jesus in everything because he shines in all that's fair because he made it all and he sustains it all. One of the most fascinating things that Isaiah says about God is that he brings out the stars by number and he calls them all by name. You see that in verse 26? He brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name. God names the stars. One of the reasons Isaiah says this is because stars were the object of worship in Babylon and in Canaanite culture. So the Babylonians and the Canaanites made up names for the stars and sort of divine God stories about the stars. They assign names to them and powers to them. Isaiah says, God makes them run their courses and calls them all by name. Now, if you know uh, Genesis 1 and 2, you know the answer to this question. Is naming, is naming things a big deal in the Hebrew scripture? And the answer is yes. Naming things is a huge deal in the Hebrew scripture. To name a thing is to exercise dominion over it. It's to exercise authority over it. In Genesis, the man is created first and he's told to name all of the animals. And then, perhaps shocking to contemporary sensibilities, but by God's good design, the Eve is created second, and God says to Adam, name her. This establishes, before the fall in Genesis 3, this establishes the, the divine pattern that men are to lead in the home and in the church. But significantly, when Adam names Eve, remember what he says? He says something utterly different than when he named the the zebra or the robin. He says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Teaching the equally true and beautiful biblical truth that the man and the woman equally share the dignity 
of the image of God. They equally share in the grace of life. They are of equal value and worth. And, and in that equality, God has ordained an authority whereby the husband, not the wife, is the head of the home, and whereby in the church the elders are the godly men of the church by his design. It is a big deal that Adam names all things in Genesis. But then again, then again, it's not actually a big deal because before Adam uh, named all the animals, God created Adam, God created all the animals, and God created and named all the starry hosts that were twinkling above Adam when he did his little project. So it's not that big of a deal. Isaiah is applying, Isaiah is applying God's naming of the stars to our common objections. God isn't powerful enough to take care of me and God doesn't care enough to take care of me. And he answers that by saying, well, well uh, God is so powerful and sufficient that he named everything, including all the stars. He's encouraging them that God is powerful and that God does care. Church, when's the last time that you doubted God's presence and God's power? You probably don't have to go back to the late 80s, right? It's probably more, 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 more uh, frequently than that. We often doubt God's presence. We often God, doubt God's power. And he wants us to see that he has the power to name the stars, to create them all. And, it, and he applies that to our worry. God's not big enough to take care of me or God doesn't really care about caring for me. Don't the words of Isaiah about God naming the stars remind you of the words of Jesus who says, church, why are you worried? Remember this, Luke 12? Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. Fear not not. You are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus says, church, why do you worry? He takes care of all the sparrows. Don't you think he loves his church more than he loves the sparrows? Isaiah says, and I don't, I don't think this is an exaggeration for me to say this. I really believe this. Isaiah says, church, God names and numbers all the stars. You are of more value than many stars. Jesus didn't bleed for the stars. In fact, the scripture tells us that the stars won't live forever. They will fall out of the sky. And the Bible assures us that you will live forever. So why would you think the God who takes the time to name and track the course of every star wouldn't care for you? Oh, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. He, he numbers every star. He knows every sparrow where it nests at night. And he numbers the hairs on the head. If you're on Jeopardy and they say the answer is 140,000, now you know the question is, what is the average number of hairs on the human head? something like 140,000. But see, Jesus uses this theological truth to show that, to show that um, God is wise enough to care for you. And, you know, we talk about God's sovereignty. We talk about, the theologians talk about God's sovereignty. The Bible teaches that God's sovereign is, God's sovereignty is to use simple words, God's sovereignty is big and God's sovereignty is small. To use the theological words, God's sovereignty is meticulous, meticulous about tiny details like the numbers of your hairs. And God's sovereignty is exhaustive, like about galaxies and the whole cosmos. God's sovereignty doesn't handle the big things at the federal level and not handle things at the little municipal level. His sovereignty does cover your hair 
And his sovereignty does cover all the kingdoms of all the world, which are as nothing to him. And so you see, Isaiah is encouraging us to trust the Lord. And church, I'm encouraging you this morning through the preaching of Isaiah 40 to trust the Lord. It is so common to... Uh, it's, so, it's sad, but this, this is the common way that we live. We don't pray... And we don't think about God. We don't pray. And we don't like Jonathan Edwards just have miscellaneous thoughts about God all day long on horseback. We don't pray. We don't think about God. And then something happens and we have this sort of hyperactive boost of God talk for like 90 minutes. And then that fades away. And then we go about another 90 days without thinking about God and without praying. And beloved, this ought not to be. This leads to fragility, which is the opposite of the stability that God's designed you for. You should be so filled with faith in God's power, so observant of God's meticulous and exhaustive sovereignty that, 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 that day by day and moment by moment you live in the presence of God. And this is, this is where peace comes from. Some of you, the problem with your prayer life is that it takes anxiety cranked up to 10 to even get you to pray in the first place. And prayer can help with anxiety, but that is not, the Bible's teaching about prayer is not don't pray at all until you're super anxious and then just use it instead of an anti-anxiety medication. That's not what prayer is. Prayer, prayer is to relate with God through every moment of every day. Don't forget Jesus' precious words in Luke 12. I often, I often find myself, when I see birds, when I'm out on my jog or walking the dog in the neighborhood, I often think of the little children's poem that was riffing off of Jesus' precious words in Luke 12. Said the robin to the sparrow, said the robin to the sparrow. I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin. Friend, I think that it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Church, you have a heavenly father who counted numbering the stars a small thing in comparison to watching over you. So church, trust him. Trust him. The core question of Isaiah 40 is like I said in verses 18 and 25, but the core argument the core argument of Isaiah 40 is in verse 27. Look at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Verse 27 is the core, because verse 27 is like the, like the worst thing that is said in the chapter. Uh, one of my books on interpreting prophetic literature said that uh, the prophets in the Old Testament are most commonly what we would call the literary genre of disputation. That is, a statement is made and then the whole section is a disputation against that statement. And you could say that Isaiah 40, the whole chapter is a disputation against verse 27. That we feel like God doesn't see us and God doesn't care about us. We're saying God's not good enough or God's not strong enough. God doesn't see what's happening to me and God's not answering my cries for help. Why do you say, oh Jacob, please allow me to get back the old KJV, which is way better. Isaiah 40, verse 27. <laughs> Why speakest thou thus? God to you. Why? Speakest thou thusly. Uh, I don't know, God, but I'm about to quit. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer. <laughs> Why speakest thou thus? His, his, uh, his sarcastic raving against the idols plays into this. Yeah, if your God's an idol, then you should speak like that. If your God's about as powerful and about as wise as Chuck E. Cheese, then you should speak like that but I don't think he is like that. 
Behold your God and stop speaking like that. That's what he's saying. And I, I just think Isaiah's flabbergasted. He's like, this should be so obvious to you. <laughs> Everything that he said about God's power from verse 1 down through verse 26 of naming the stars. And then he says, why speakest thou thus? He's like, this is insane that you're doing this. It's so obvious. God's power should be so obvious that when you say this, everyone in the world should be like, that is crazy. It reminds me, it's, it's a couple of years ago now, but even though it's a couple of years ago, hopefully you remember it. It's, it's like a, it's a famous meme now. It was during, I think it was in Minneapolis, during some of the riots, uh, news reporter, microphone, and what he says is, the Twin Cities are experiencing mostly peaceful protests. And behind him, people are going in and out of the broken target, carrying everything they can, and three other buildings are burning. I was like, uh, what you're saying doesn't accord with the reality that we see. That's verse 27. Everything that we are seeing about the power of God, and you're saying God's not going to take care of you? How can you deny what's so obvious? There's the question. There's the question. How can you deny what is so obvious? The power of God is eternally obvious. The power of God is unassailably obvious. So the question is, how can you deny what is so obvious? And the answer to that question is by putting self at the center and God somewhere out there in the periphery. That's how. That's how. By putting circumstances, personal preferences, and selfish will at the center and putting God far away. Far away. And so we get to Isaiah's stirring conclusion. Verse 29 he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. He's telling us we need to open our eyes to God's power and strength, and we need to wait on the Lord. What does that expression mean, verse 31? They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. I think, I think waiting for the Lord is a Christian thing that we all say all the time, but I wonder if I mean the same thing about waiting on the Lord as you do. I wonder if we even know what it means. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? To wait on the Lord means to live with God's will at the center instead of self-will. To wait on the Lord means to live with God's will at the center instead of self-will. And, if, and one more simple definition, to wait on the Lord means to live with a confident expectation that God is and that God is good, that God is with me for my good. To live with a confident expectation that God is and in Jesus Christ, God is with me for my good. To live with God at the center and to live with a confident expectation that God is good. If I could very briefly turn you to, to two precious places about waiting on the Lord. Both of them are in the Psalms. First, I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, just to show you a verse out of here. Because waiting on the Lord is the practical conclusion, but we're confused about what it means. The definition of waiting on the Lord ought to be simple. And yet it's something that eludes us. What happens is that we have trouble waiting on the Lord... Because in our self-will, we're insistent on our timing instead of God's timing. After all, waiting on the Lord is all about timing, right? And I'm, I'm not here to tell you uh, because God is God, timing is unimportant. It is true that in a sense, timing is everything, right? The difference today for lunch, the difference between a delicious, green, crisp salad and brown garbage is timing. It's the exact same thing, but it's timing. And, and when we're waiting on the Lord, we're learning to trust God's power, God's will, 
and God's timing as opposed to our self-driven agenda of our timing. That's the issue. It's to wait on the Lord. I begin to sin when in my impatience I take things into my own hands instead of trusting God's timing. Anyway, what I wanted to show you out of Psalm 37 was, uh, look at what he says about waiting on the Lord. Verse 3, 37, 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noon day. Trust in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Oh, I love verse 5. Trust in him and he will act. Can I challenge you to take a new word into your vocabulary? A, a new two-word phrase. Faithful inactivity. How about it? Verse 5. Trust in him he will act. There's a sweet biblical category of faithful inactivity. Now, it may be the case that most of y'all are lazy and I need to kick you into activity. I admit that. But there are some of you that I need to push you toward faithful inactivity. Trust in him. He will do it. And I love verse 5a, commit your way to the Lord. This is this is like a, a KJV day. I like the old translation of verse 5 more. It's, it literally, the, the Hebrew is literally, roll thy ways upon Jehovah. Roll, whatever you're anxious about, roll thy ways upon Jehovah. Trust in him and he will act. I'm a, I love to sing. I'm not a, like a, a hand waver or razor when I sing. I just don't. But in the time I raise my hands the most, not that it's any of your business, is probably in private prayer. Ever since I learned that, that, that the Hebrew was literally roll thy ways upon Jehovah, it will often be the case in the morning that something is burdening me. And I'll just say, God, I'm just, I'm just using my puny strength to roll this, and I know you're going to take it. I just know you're going to take it. Roll thy ways upon Jehovah. Trust in him. Trust in him. He will act. He will act. And then from Psalm 37, I'd ask you lastly to just flip ahead to Psalm 62, another precious verse about waiting on the Lord. Psalm 62, we all have favorite psalms. I don't know. I don't know if Psalm 62 is my favorite psalm. I'm not sure this would qualify, but I would say if you ask me what psalm have you turned to the most, uh, when you had to go to a motorcycle accident and the guy wasn't going to make it? What psalm have you turned to the most when they got the worst news and they called you and you had to meet them like in the parking lot at the hospital? It's probably Psalm 62. He says in verse 1, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. See verse 5, for God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God my salvation and my glory rest. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. You see how he says in verse 1, for God alone my soul waits in silence. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. Waiting on God is not mostly waiting for what I really, really, really want to happen and then sprinkling a little God on it. I'm talking to you. Waiting on God is not worrying with all my heart about what I really, really, really don't want to happen and then sprinkling a little God on it to protect me from it. What if waiting on the Lord is waiting on the Lord? I want what I want, and I'm afraid of what I'm afraid of. 
And Jesus is sweet enough to say that he cares about what I want and he cares about what I'm afraid of. But in the end, I'm not only waiting on my preferred outcome or for God to to do this or not do that. I'm waiting on the Lord. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. There it is, right? There it is. I shall not be greatly shaken. If the biggest thing to you is what you really, really want to happen or what you really, really, really don't want to happen, then you are always at risk, always at risk of being shaken. But if God, if God being God is what you really, really want, church then and only then, you will never be shaken. Never. When what we're afraid of happens, when what we really want doesn't come to pass, then God is the one there to comfort us. Jesus, Jesus wailed in, in sorrow, bereft of his heavenly Father's presence on the, on, at Golgotha. Jesus is the one to help you through when the worst happens but you're waiting on Jesus to be with you. Jesus and Jesus only. And so church, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes to God. Behold your God. It's only those who wait on the Lord that mount up with wings like eagles. It's only those who wait on the Lord that don't grow weary. If circumstantial deliverance is the only thing I'm seeking, then I'm refreshed when I get it and I'm weary when I don't. But if the Lord and his presence is what sustains me, then I am like those who mount up with wings like eagles and I'm like those who run and don't grow weary and those who walk and never faint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we would wait on you and you only. I pray, Heavenly Father, for these precious brothers and sisters who are in the room with me. Oh, I pray for them, Lord, that you would be present with them, removing their doubts. Jesus, that your sweet promise of caring for each one would be the end of anxiety and of self-will and that all of us would be enabled to trust in you. I pray, Lord, that through worship in song, I pray, Lord, that through our fellowship with one another now and in ABF, and I pray, Lord, that even through the preaching of your word in Isaiah's 40th chapter, that we would be enabled to cease striving and know that you are God, to behold you and to wait on you with the fullness of faith that you have given. Bless your people with this. For Jesus' sake, amen.